Good morning. Welcome to Elmira Baptist Church Sunday School for March 21st, 2021. March 21st, 2021. We're studying reciprocal living and a warm welcome to everyone. Now, it's always a challenge to teach the class when I can't see you. There's no feedback. You can't answer questions or ask questions, and I can't answer questions I don't know that you have. So I look forward to the time that we can be back together uh, again, face to face, so that I can see your wonderful faces and um, see your smiles and see your uh, and hear your feedback and questions. And mm -hmm. so I try to go as slow as I can and also repeat things and make it easy to understand and make the outline more complete so that there are no blanks necessarily and if you have a question and you can always go back on sermon audio and play this back which is nice or facebook um, or if uh, you go to youtube as well i like sermon audio because they're all lined up right together and church one is another place where you can go so we have been studying reciprocal living, which is the study of the one and other commands that are marked by the reciprocal pronouns, one another and each other. And this lesson is a milestone because this is our final and 25th command, um, one another command that we're studying. And it's love one another. Uh, it may be our last command that we are studying, but it's the first command in Scripture. We have, according to the Lord, it's the first command and uh, of the one and others. We've done two introductory lessons. We did one on fellowship starting September 13th, 2020. So we've gone about six months. And then we, then we looked at an introduction not only to fellowship, then the next week we looked at an introduction to reciprocal living. And then we've done 25 commands, including this week and next week. We're going to do love one another and two lessons. And we've done eight commands on interrelationships. We've done seven commands that are negative commands. Do not lie. Uh, do not uh, murmur, do not bite and devour, do not provoke one another, etc. Then five commands on edification, which are uh, build up one another, teach one another, exhort one another, and so forth. And then five on service, which are be servants to one another, bear one another's burdens, be kind to one another, extend hospitality to one another. So eight, seven, five, and five is 25. And the last one that we're going to teach and share is love one another. And again, it may be the last command that we do, but it's really the first command. We're going to do it in two parts because there's so much material here and it's the most important. And all the other commands are wrapped up in this command briefly. So we're going to, we have a four page handout and I didn't want you to worry, we're not going to do all four pages today. We're going to do the first two pages today and the second two pages next Sunday on the 28th. We have a little bit non-standard for us in this lesson, these lessons, uh, introduc rather uh, handout. The introduction on page one, command plus some other passages where this command is found on page one, significance of the command on page two, and basis for definition, and that's all we'll do today. And then next Sunday we'll do the definition, and we'll do comment, Christ's love for us on page 3 and on page 4. Our love for others, a biblical example, both positive and negative, and then comment on the attitude it takes and is required to obey this command. So, by virtue of introduction, before we get started, let's uh, we'll, we'll start out with one, two, and three on page one of the introduction. But I want to uh, I want to pray uh, before we get started and ask the Lord to be with us. This is a 
difficult to define, but easy to see the results of uh, love one another. Love is easy to, hard to define, but easy to, to feel and to see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of sharing these one another commands. I pray that you would help us to grow, to abound more and more in your love and that, that you would help us to love one another, help us to be known as a church that loves one another. I pray that you would be with each one that is, that is listening and watching uh, the stream, and I pray that you would be with us, help me to speak clearly, help me to speak your words, help me to articulate what you would have us to know about this command, and that we would all take this to heart that we would all take this seriously, that we would all give attention to loving one another as you have loved us. I pray for this time that we have together. I pray your blessing upon all those who tune in. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> and uh, before we start, I want to make sure that I thank Roy for his uh, great help. He's our videographer, if you will, and talented camera technician person and as you know it takes a lot to make this uh, this technical aspect of the videoing work well so I'm very thankful and it's also to, it's hard to put me in a good light and he always does and I appreciate that so by word of introduction and loving one another um, just before uh, looking at number one just before his betrayal our Lord's betrayal, his arrest, and his trial, and his death, he spent, the Lord spent one last evening with his disciples. He used this time to instruct and to comfort, number two, uh, and forewarn them, knowing that this time that he had with them was short and that he would soon leave them. Jesus told his disciples some of the most basic and important matters, fundamental and important matters in a Christian life. He talked about the meaning of his death. He talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He talked about, he talked about the hope of the life to come in the Father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. And there, there, his Father's house has many mansions. And he talked about the mission which the disciples were to carry out in his absence. He talked about the conflict between the world and believers. And then finally, number three, he gave his disciples one last command. That command was that they love one another. This command is echoed in almost all the writings and books of the New Testament. And it's foundational. It's foundational to the Christian life. And to all the other commands, it's the most important command. <clears throat> and we're going to look at that in John 13, uh, 33 and 35. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. John 13, 33, reading through 35. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, he's speaking to the apostles uh, on the, in the, what some call the Last Supper, but it was a celebration of the last Passover. He said, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, so that ye also love one another. In verse 35, and by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have love one to another. I'm going to look at that a little bit. Um, he says in verse 33, he starts out with the term, little children, yet a little while I am with you. And that little children is a tender term of endearment, of love to the, to the apostles and the disciples. Uh, and he had not used that before and didn't use it afterwards. It's used two other places, I think, in the New Testament. But it's a term of love and endearment. I thought that was interesting how he started that out. Um, this is 
The, this command was first stated at the final Passover just before he left. And I want to share a quote with you that kind of describes that. We know that this command is, um, or this, the word love is expressed uh, by several different words in Greek. And two of them are agape and phileo. Agape is spelled A-G-A-P-E. A-G-A-P as in Paul, E. And then phileo is spelled P-H-I-L-E-O. And agape is a godly love, and phileo is a friendly love. And see, Philadelphia, I always remember, Philadelphia is a city, Delphi is a city, and phileo is love, city of brotherly love. So it's not anymore, but that's what it was at one time. <laughs> Kidding. Okay, uh, I have an anonymous quote, and then I'm going to share uh, another quote uh, by MacArthur. The first quote, Biblical agape love is the love of choice. I want you to listen careful to, uh, carefully with the distinctions, and that's why I love this, this particular quote. Agape love is a godly love of choice. It's the love of serving <coughs> humility, the highest kind of love, the noblest kind of devotion, the love of the will, it's intentional, a conscious choice kind of love, and not motivated by superficial appearance or emotional attraction or sentimental relationship. Agape love is not based on pleasant emotions or good feelings that might result from a physical attraction or a family bond. Agape chooses as an act of self-sacrifice to serve the recipient. From all of the descriptions of agape love, it is clear that true agape love is a sure mark, a distinguishing mark of salvation. Agape is volitional. That means based on will, based on choice, based on decision. Phileo is, is emotional. It's based on feelings, based on desires, and based on impulses. Agape love does not depend on the world's criteria for love, such as attractiveness, emotions, or sentimentality. Believers can fall easily into the trap, of the worldly trap, of blindly following the world's demand that a lover feel positive toward the beloved. This is not agape love, but it's a love based on impulse. Impulsive love, kind of on the spot feeling. Impulsive love characterizes the spouse who announced to the other spouse that they're planning to divorce their mate. Why? Well, they reason, I can't help it. I fell in love with another person. Christians must understand that this type of impulsive love is completely contrary to God's decisive love, which is decisive. It's a matter of the will because he is in control and has a purpose in mind. There are many reasons a proper understanding of truth of God's word and of the world's lie is critical. And one of the foremost is that Jesus declared that in our passage, John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. And then the second quote, and I, this is short, but I want you to, this first sentence, I want you to sear into your brain. Agape love is, according to MacArthur, and I believe this, the greatest virtue of the Christian life. And you think, oh, how could that be? I mean, we've got faith, we've got hope, we've got all kinds of other things, steadfastness, and lots of other qualities. But what does 1 Corinthians say? Faith, hope, and love, which is the greatest, love. That's, that's, that's striking to me. We're talking about the greatest virtue of Christian life. He goes on to say, yet that type of love was rare in Greek literature. That's because the traits that agape love portrays, unselfishness, self-giving, willful devotion, concern for the welfare of others, 
were mostly disdained, looked down upon in the ancient Greek culture as signs of weakness. However, the New Testament declares agape to be the character trait around which the others revolve. All others center and revolve around love. The Apostle John writes, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him, 1 John 4, 16. Now, I want to take a moment to briefly read not all of this list of the commands found indirectly or directly, uh, but I want to read number one and number three, number four, and number eight, and number 10, and then number 11. And number 11, we're going to comment on uh, quite a bit. So I'm going to read those. You can follow along or you can just listen, whatever it is helps you to concentrate the most. I would like for you to hear and listen to how many, and I'm doing this to show how many times love and love one another is mentioned in, in, in the New Testament and the, the, the recurring theme that exists over and over and over again. John 15, 12 through 17, number one. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. We look at Romans 13, 8 next. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then number four, Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. Interesting. Two different passages that show that the whole law is fulfilled in loving one another. And let's look at uh, number 8, which is 1 Peter 1. 22 through 23 seeing ye have been seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned that's unpre, unpre, pretended love uh, not, not a true love not a pretended love you've obeyed the truth through the scripture unto unfeigned love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then 1 John 3, 11 through 23, a little bit longer passage, but a lot of tremendous, wonderful insights here. For this is the message, 1 John 3, 11 through 23, starting in verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and the wicked one being Satan, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Why did he do that? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know, no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
For whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, how does the how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in indeed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God, and whatever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, listen to his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. And then finally, now looking at number 11, uh, this passage is 1 John 4, 7 through 21. This would be one to follow along with if you would like, because I am going to give you, first of all, five reasons why Christians love, drawn from a, a, a passage and, and a, a, an article by uh, John MacArthur. Why Christians love, five reasons. And then I'm gonna add two reasons you should love from the word, but that I, that I came up with. So seven total, five from MacArthur, two from Scotty. Okay. Beloved, starting in verse 7 of 1 John 4, reading through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So the first reason that we, why Christians love, is we love because God is love. Love is inherent in, in, in everything he does. God is love. God equals love. Um, so we love because God is love. And then verses 9, 10, and 11 for number two. We love to follow the example of Christ's sacrificial love for us by his going to the cross and being a propitiation for our sins and dying on the cross for our sin and making it possible for us to be saved. So verses 9, 10, and 11 for number two. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because God, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So first one is we love because God is love. The second one is we love to follow the example of Christ's sacrificial love for us. Number three, <clears throat> love is the evidence to the world of God's love. No one's seen God at any time. You can't see his love. But you can see Christians loving one another. And so love is the heart of the Christian witness. So, number verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Love is the evidence to the world of God's invisible love and God being invisible himself. We are in person representing God to the world. Love is the heart of the Christian witness and our love for one another. Okay. So first was we love because God is, is love. We love to follow the example of Christ's sacrifice. Love is the evidence to the world of God's love. It's the heart of the Christian witness. Love is the heart of the Christian witness. And number four, verses 15 and 16, love is the Christian's assurance. We have assurance in Christ's love. Reading verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us. 
and God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. If we dwell in love, we have assurance that God is in us. Love is a Christian's assurance. So we have verses 7 and 8. We love because God is love, 9, 10, and 11. We love to follow the example of Christ's sacrificial love that he provided when he went to the cross, 12, 13, and 14. Love is the heart of the Christian witness, and we're the example of the unseen to, uh, to the world. And in 15 and 16, number four, we have assurance in Christ's love. Love is the Christian's assurance. And then verses 17 and 18 is we have love is the Christian's confidence. We have com love gives us confidence. Even facing judgment, we can be confident. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So we had five there. Verses 7 and 8, we have, this is not in your handout, we love because God is love. 8, 10, and, 9, 10, and 11. Number two, we follow the example of Christ's sacrificial love. We love to follow the example. And then 12, 13, and 14, love is the heart of the Christian witness. Verses 15 and 16, number four, love is the Christian's assurance. And number uh, five, love is the Christian's confidence in verses 17 and 18. Then I'm going to add verse 19. We love because he first loved us. I do not believe it would be possible for us to love using a godly love, agape love, that, that he demonstrated for us. We would not be able to love were it not for what God did for us. We love him because he first loved us, verse 19. Romans 5, 8 says, But God committed his love toward us in that we were, while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You know, when we believe and we accept what this, the substitutionary death of Christ for our sins and we ask to be saved, we're reconciled, we're forgiven, we're clothed with Christ's righteousness, we're brought into the body of Christ, the church, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Uh, we're a new creation in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit produces this fruit, the, the, this the love and all of the other qualities of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit. We're capable of loving because he died for us. He loved us. Even John 3.16 says, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God sheds, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Now, often... Uh, you'll see the word him omitted in this sentence when it's discussed because some people think that that should read we love because he first loved us. And it really doesn't matter whether we leave the him out or not in one sense because God gave us the capacity to love as Christians that we did not have before. Our love was based on what other people did for us, not because we made a choice to love in a godly way, an agape love. Because of what he did for us, he made it us able to love one another. <clears throat> and we love him and everything else and everyone else because of what he did for us, that sacrifice. What a profound statement. We love him and we love because he first loved us. And then that's number six. We love because he first loved us. And number seven, we love because he commanded it. Um, we love to obey him. Um, obedience equals love. Love equals obedience. If a man say, verse 20 and 21, if a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? That's a powerful argument. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. 
So turn to the top of page two and let's look at the significance of this command. The Lord attached the greatest significance to this command when he stated that obedience to this command is a distinguishing mark. It's a brand, if you will. It is a indica strong indication that it's a sign to everyone that a person is a believer, is his believer, a Christian. And it's evidence that the person is a Christian. Now, John 13, 35, the Lord himself said, by this, that's obedience to this command, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Powerful statement. He said, we know that love is a quality, reading from number one on the top of page two. Love is a quality that's enabled by God. And as we know, it's a fruit of the Spirit. Not just love, but love for one another is absolutely necessary to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have another quote by Mr. Ironside, H.A. Ironside. <clears throat> if you and I have the mind of Christ, this divine love will be manifested in us. If it is not manifested in us, then all our talk about the fundamentalists, being fundamentalists, uh, being devout fundamentalists, and all our talk about standing for the truth goes for very little indeed. We may be tremendously in earnest contending for some great outstanding doctrines and facts, but if we contend in a bad spirit without love, we only harm the cause we represent and if the back of our contention for the faith, and back of that, that advocating for the faith, there's no sincere love for the brethren, then we dishonor the one who himself is the way, the truth, and the life. He has said, the Lord Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, John 13, 35. That is, we do not prove that we are Christ's disciples by striving for a creed, however great and right and exact that may be. We do not prove that we are his disciples by insisting on the fact that we believe in an inspired Bible, blessed as that is. We do not prove that we are his disciples by loudly proclaiming, proclaiming our faith in the virgin birth and the perfect humanity of our Savior, his atoning work, his physical resurrection, and his present intercession at God's right hand. We do not prove to men and women that we are really Christians by insisting we believe in the premillennial coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these wonderful, great, and precious truths and doctrines. But by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Let us not forget this and let us examine ourselves faithfully and honestly and see if we're allowing hatred and malice in our hearts while presuming to be holding to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a relative statement. He believes in all those things, or he did, and I do as well, but love is more important. That's a profound statement. Uh, number two, the Apostle John also said that a person who does not love his brother does not love God either. Now, that doesn't sound like that could be right, but it is. It says it right in Scripture. Not loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is evidence that you don't love God. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. That's a powerful statement. If you have trouble loving people, you need to look at your faith. You need to look at to see if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number three, because, because <clears throat> loving one another is a command from God, it has two important implications. There are two distinctives here. Number one, A, 
loving one another is not optional. In our culture, we often do things when we want to or we just feel like it. Isn't that true? Those who believe and trust in Christ must love all other believers in obedience to him. And I would add, whether we feel like it or not, whether they're lovely or not, whether they're attractive or not, whether they're a pain or not. If we love God, we will love our brothers and sisters. I just read why in 1 John 4.20. Refusal to love one another is to disobey God's command. Number two, the second implication of loving one another being a command from God. Loving one another, reading from B under three on page two. Loving one another requires effort and obedience with the Holy Spirit's power enabling. It's not just automatic. You can't just lay back and say, I'm loving. Not true. Loving one another specifically requires our action. It's not a passive activity. It requires action. It requires obedience to all of Christ's commands. This one, loving one another, and all of the others, because all of the others are briefly represented in the command to love one another. They're all there. So this requires obedience to all of the commands that he gave us the one another commands. Loving one another is an action. It's obedience. If we love Christ, we will obey him. In 1 John, uh, four, or rather not 1 John, but the Gospel of John 14, I'm going to read verse 15, 21 through 15, 21, and 23 through 24 as listed in the handout here. If you love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest my, myself to him. So in verse 15 and verse 21, he says, Christ equates obedience to love. So if you're a math person, love equals obedience. Obedience equals love. If we love him, we'll obey his commands. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And verse 24, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the words which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. Now, I want to read one more Ironside quote here. <coughs> said, um, that, and I want, when we get to the last paragraph, I want you to answer these questions to yourself. It was then that he gave this new commandment. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. It was his last charge to his saints, the disciples, and us true. Before he went to the cross, looking down through the years, he knew that they would have and be in a hostile world, that, and they would be hated of all men for his name's sake. And he pleaded with them, don't hate one another. Don't be ungracious and unkind and quarrelsome and discourteous to each other. Ye who have been redeemed by the same precious blood and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Now, here's where I want you to think about and answer, answer these questions to yourself, not out loud. Um, we must challenge ourselves, and each one ask the question in his own heart. How have I answered to this command of my Savior? Am I characterized by love for my brother, brethren in Christ? Or have I so far forgotten my responsibility as a Christian that I have permitted malice and envy and jealousy and even hatred to well up in my heart? Have I cherished these evil things? There are children of God who are cold and hard and indifferent and critical and unkind. 
we may well face these things in the presence of God. We may answer to God in the judgment. So I don't want to do that. And so I'm motivated. I hope you are too. And let's look at the last basis for the definition. If we're to love one another, then how do we define love? Love's a word that has been misused and distorted and certainly misunderstood and perverted by the world. It's an inward quality that shows itself in action. John recognizes this when he defines love in 1 John 4, 8 through 10. He that loveth and he, lo he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Here's the action. God loved. Then he God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Love is not just uh, a static. It, it, it's an inward, it dwells inwardly. It's a quality. And then it re expresses itself in an action. Now, what I have... Uh, quote here, another short quote that I want to uh, read to you. Uh, Biblical agape love is not an emotion, but it's a disposition, an inclination of the heart to seek the welfare and meet the needs of others. Greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends, Jesus said in John 15, 13. And MacArthur says, and that's exactly what he did himself. We have no capacity to generate agape love on our own. The Greek word for that kind of love is agape and is characterized by humility, obedience to God, and self-sacrifice. And we know it's made possible as a fruit of the Holy Spirit that he reproduces in us. Um, I was trying to figure out how to close this because I just didn't want to say, and tune in next week for part two. So I wanted to leave you with uh, what interestingly I found in the days of praise that comes to my email uh, inbox. And here's the one for March 19th. Love's longing prayer. And I think this is a great prayer for us to pray. Uh, Paul wrote it for the Philippians. He said, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment. Paul's longing for the Philippian church, this is written by Henry uh, H. Henry Morris III, HM, HMM3. Paul's longing for the Philippian church is eloquently expressed in his prayer for their maturing in the faith. It begins simply with a prayer for their growing in love that will abound more and more. And this phrase is only used two other times in the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, 10. Essentially, this prayer is that their love would abound more and more. That is, never stop increasing. What a prayer! That their love would never stop increasing. The focus of the ever-increasing love, however, is not the emotional reactions or depth of feeling. It's a non-stop, ever-growing love for knowledge and judgment or discernment. As one might expect, the Holy Spirit's choices of words are important, so we're gonna look at knowledge and judgment briefly. Several Greek words could be translated as knowledge. Uh, Paul's choice and the Holy Spirit's choice for Philippians 1.9 is epinosis, spelled E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S, E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. It's a term that emphasizes uh, understanding of facts and truth. And it carries an intensive meaning with a fuller, clearer, comprehensive, more thorough knowledge than just being aware of some facts or data. A person with epinosis, it means full knowledge, knows more, no, actually knows both what and why they have certain facts. It's a comprehensive, thorough knowledge to know all about and completely understand. And then the word judgment 
is a translation of the word AIS, T H E S I S, AI thesis. And it, it's an unusual term that demands perception, understanding, or discernment of what to do with the knowledge that we're praying for. And both terms are intellectually based, not emotionally based, and requiring a growing grasp of information. Both are the product of love, not a product of the human standards of high intelligence. Paul wants us to, and the Philippians, when he wrote it to them, that their love may grow and grow and more in knowledge, comprehensive, all-encompassing knowledge, and in an all-discernment and, and perception in how to apply that knowledge. So he ends this uh, short days of praise by saying three things. We must be rooted and grounded in love, Ephesians 3.17. And we must speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, and always be conscious of our relationships so that we can increase in the edifying of ourselves in love. Ephesians 4.16, rooted and grounded in love, speak the truth in love, and be conscious of our relationships so that we can increase of edifying in love. Finally, there's this overarching statement. He said, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. That's my prayer for our church and for us, each one of you who is tuning in. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. Lord, help us to grow more and more, that we will abound more and more in the knowledge and discernment and in love. And I pray, Father, that you would be with us. Help us to absorb this material. Help us to think about it during the week. Help us to look at what is important about loving one another and why we should reflect your love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would be with us, be with those that couldn't be here. Pray for those that are ill, that you would be with them. And we pray, Father, for the service to follow, that you would bless it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.